This is The Red Line, where we talk to three expert witnesses about one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. As most good stories start, this one begins in a bar, a dimly lit, paint-peeling little bar on the outskirts of Old Tbilisi. I was sitting there with an Armenian man, having a few bottles of wine and chatting about the world. And after the second or third bottle, he proposed me a wager. A wager I'm sure he'd had won many drinks from over the years. He would buy the next round of drinks if I could name him the nation with the most national coups over the last hundred years. So I scratched my head and thought about all the usual suspects in Latin America, Africa or the Middle East, and then leaned back in my chair gave a slight grin, and proposed my answer, turkey. And that answer cost me a bottle of wine. I was wrong. Whilst yes, Turkey had had seven attempted or successful coups, the top nation has had 19. And it wasn't a country I really suspected. It was a nation I had traveled to quite a number of times, even gone there with my family. It was Thailand. It's hard to think of a nation with more misconceptions about it than Thailand, a country everybody has heard of, but no one seems to know very much about. In Australia or Russia, almost everyone you meet has at one point traveled to Holiday and Bangkok. And it's a wonderful city. It's got great nightlife. It's got amazing temples. It's a beautiful, vibrant, growing city laced in long gold banners. The color of the king. But past the tourists, you notice Thailand has effectively been ruled by a succession of military hunters who answer almost directly to a king. A king who still holds draconian Lady Majesty laws that can have you jail for up to five years just for besmirching his name. Thailand is a lot more complicated than the average outsider would ever realize. So let's go past the surface, behind the veneers of the tourism brochures, and take a look into the geopolitics of Thailand and its impact into the region. And to talk a little more about that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. A Democratic Dictatorship well, I think most people know of Thailand as a, as a nice place to take a vacation, uh, and, it, and it certainly is that. It's got um, wonderful beaches, uh, excellent cuisine, um, beautiful mountains, um, and of course, uh, the people are, are lovely. Uh, but it's also a place that's experienced a lot of political turmoil, and I think a lot of visitors uh, may not be uh, aware of the, uh, the scope and the depth of, of the political tensions here, um, because a casual visitor um, may not notice anything um, amiss or, or not pick up on, on these tensions. Uh, and I think this this part of uh, of the story of Thailand is is perhaps not as well known. Matt Wheeler is a senior analyst for the Crisis Group, specialising in Thailand. He's been working and studying in Thailand now for many years, and is currently based in his capital city, Bangkok. He joins us today. Thailand has um, el- elements of of despotism uh, that operate. Uh, as well as some some of the mechanisms that we associate with with parliamentary democracy, um, but after the the military coup in 2014, we had a, a long period, of five five plus years of outright military rule, uh, which uh, really only ended with a general election in um, March last year. Uh, and uh, some people would still argue that uh, in spite of uh, the trappings of parliamentary democracy, that uh, what we have now is just the, the junta in a, in a slightly modified form. So let's talk about those coups. Since 1932, Thailand has been through 19 military coups, 12 of those being successful. Why does the Thai military intervene so much into domestic Thai politics? Well, I think one way to look at it is that Thailand has unresolved um, unresolved uh, tensions that have ar- arisen um, with the end of the absolute monarchy in June 1932. And, and it's possible to think of these tensions as centering on the issue of political legitimacy. 
Uh, so it, it, on the one hand, there's the legitimacy that comes from popular sovereignty, that comes from elections, um, and uh, that is represented uh, in parliament and through political parties. And on the other hand, there's legitimacy that derives from a more traditional uh, hierarchy that prevailed um, during the absolute monarchy. That's really grounded in a, a sense of, of, of what's moral and, and what's right. And uh, politics in Thailand has been characterized by those who uh, are worried about majoritarianism and the excesses of, of what they call the tyranny of, of democracy um, as, as something of a dirty game. Um, and so when there are, or when there have been um, uh, political problems, uh, tensions in parliament, uh, um, uh, scandals, corruption, often the, the army has presented itself as the, the man on the white horse that can come in and act in a disinterested fashion to, to clean up the situation. Um, and they've done this um, always in defense of, uh, of the monarchy. Uh, which has allowed them to to claim a uh, mantle of legitimacy. At the moment, I live in Australia, where like Thailand, we are a constitutional monarchy and the British Queen is still technically our head of state, but she doesn't involve herself in politics over here at all. But what about Thailand? How involved is the Thai royal family in domestic politics? Yeah, you can tell I'm a little, <laughs> a little bit nervous talking about this. I mean, one thing your your readers may be, I mean, sorry, your listeners may be interested to know, uh, is that you know I'm constrained by the Les Majesté law here, uh, Article One One Two of the Criminal Code, um, and that um, prescribes three to fifteen years for for people who are found guilty of defaming the king, um, the queen, the heir apparent, or the regent. So this this definitely um, is uh, is a consideration uh, for for those who who live in Thailand or who wish to visit Thailand when discussing the monarchy. When we talk about the 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 monarchy and its and its involvement with politics, we're really talking about uh, King Bhumibol Adunyadet, the the ninth king of the current Chakri dynasty who became king in, in 1946 when he was uh, just 18 years old. So at that time, the, the monarchy was at uh, an adir, had very little power, very little influence. Um, but over the course of uh, his 70 year reign, uh, the, the crown was, was transformed into um, the center of a, of a political and ideological complex known as uh, democracy with the king as head of state. Uh, so, with the help of uh, a prime minister, Sarit Tanarat, uh, who was a, a, a general, a field marshal, uh, who took power in the late 1950s, he rehabilitated uh, the monarchy uh, and used it to legitimize his own rule. Um, and uh, over time, uh, particularly through royal projects and through um, uh, a lot of tours through uh, the provinces and the countryside, uh, the king built up an image and uh, a sense of devotion from, uh, from people throughout the country. Uh, the monarchy was rehabilitated um, and it recovered a great deal of, of the influence that it had lost uh, uh, with the, the end of the absolute monarchy in 1932. Um, and particularly after um, a democratic uh, uprising in the early 1970s, uh, where the king intervened on behalf of um, students who were calling for a new constitution and for, for greater um, popular sovereignty. Um, he was uh, seen as, uh, as a, a monarch with, with some democratic credentials. Um, he's intervened uh, at, at later points, um, not, not always necessarily on, on the side of, of those asking for uh, greater, uh, greater democracy. Um, but the, the, the ninth king, uh, Rama Nain, King Bumipon, uh, 
developed a, a great deal of um, of charisma uh, and legitimacy um, that he was able to deploy. Um, in 2005, Duncan McCargo came out with an article and coined the phrase network monarchy. And this was the idea that the king uh, was able to um, affect his preferences in, in politics and society, not directly, but through a network of people uh, who could, could act in his interest, uh, particularly uh, people in the, the Privy Council. So from the locals I've spoke with, Rama the Ninth was incredibly popular and loved by a huge majority of the nation. But after his death, the crown was passed down to his son, Rama the Tenth, who doesn't seem to have the same level of sway with the public as his father. Uh, do you think that's a fair assessment? I think that's a fair reading. Um, I think it's, it's, it's common knowledge that... Um, uh, the current king has had uh, a bit of a, a checkered personal history. Um, he's had, um, I think, four wives. Uh, and even in his short reign, he uh, appointed a, a, a royal consort. Um, and then just a few months later, stripped her of her royal titles. Um, so I think he's he's had a reputation Um uh, throughout uh, his adult life as, uh, as a bit of a, a playboy. And I think that uh, that certainly colors people's uh, perceptions of him. The most recent of the coups was in 2014, where head of the army Prayut Chanochan staged a coup, ousted the democratically elected government, and placed himself as de facto prime minister of Thailand. And this was the state of affairs for the following five years, with the army in control of most matters for the country. Then we get to 2019, where the country heads back to the polls for the first time in almost a decade, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. The election happens, and Prayut somewhat wins, and remains as Prime Minister of Thailand. So what I want to know first of all, is Prayut actually a civilian-style Prime Minister, or is he just another general in a business suit? Uh, I would say that uh, Prime Minister Prayut, um, though he's uh, retired, doesn't doesn't necessarily represent uh, the army as an institution, but I think he he represents uh, the broader establishment. Uh, so we would include in that the the military, of which you know the army is the most important part, um, the bureaucracy, particularly the judiciary, um, the palace certainly, uh, and then assorted uh, plutocrats uh, who benefit from the status quo. Um, so I think I think Prayut um, certainly represents the interests of, of, of this element of Thai society. Uh, I mean, he he certainly has some popular support as well. Um, he's he's a, a sort of an avuncular uh, character. Uh, he's kind of gruff and straight talking, um, and and uh, has that sort of appeal uh, at a popular level for some people. You know, he's he's spent his career in the Queen's Guard. Uh, he came up with um, General Prawit Wong Sawan, uh, who is now the leader of the Palang Pracharat Party, the military-backed party, as well as a deputy prime minister, uh, and General Anupong Pauchinda, who is the interior minister now. Um, and they were all in the, the Queen's Guard, uh, a faction uh, known as uh, Burapapayak, or the Eastern Tigers. They were all army chiefs uh, succeeding each other, and they were all involved in the 2014 coup, as well as the 2006 coup. So outside observers might say the only reason Prayut held on to power in 2019 was due to changes his party made to the Constitution in 2017, changing the rules for the upper house and how they're selected. It's all part of Thailand's particularly odd system of government, where both the upper and lower houses vote for the prime minister. So to summarize it very quickly, Thailand's whole government contains 750 seats, that's both upper and lower houses, which means you need 376 seats to achieve a majority. But 250 of those 750 seats are the upper house, and they are all picked by the military, who will almost always back the most favorable candidate to them. 
So Prayut went into the election with a guaranteed 250 seats, knowing the military would back him, and he would only need 176 of the 500 available to remain as PM. And he actually only even achieved that by forming a coalition of 61 political parties, one of the most fractured alliances in all of Asia. Which raises a pretty important question. With that in mind, is it possible to actually win an election without having the backing of the military in their guaranteed 250 seats? It's extremely difficult. Uh, and of course, this is by design. Um, this was, uh, this is how the, the 2017 constitution was drafted um, to, to essentially allow the junta to continue to govern, uh, but with a, a veneer of, of democratic legitimacy. Uh, and as, as you pointed out, the, the Senate is, is one of the ways, one of the most important ways in which they are able to do that. Uh, but there's also the electoral system, um, which favors uh, medium-sized parties uh, and sort of disadvantages uh, parties that were uh, heretofore dominant, like uh, the Taksin aligned uh, Phuetai party. Um, and there uh, is also in the constitution provisions that give greater power to the so-called independent agencies like the, the electoral commission uh, national anti-corruption commission and the like uh, who have broad authority to uh, to intervene in uh, executive and legislative affairs and these are various ways that the uh, the 2017 constitution tries to circumscribe the power of uh, elected politicians. And in fact, we saw in the, in the 2019 election that the, the military backbone Pracharat party was, was only able to, to form a government after the electoral commission uh, intervened. This was after the polling uh, to suggest that the formula for allocating party list seats be changed. Uh, which it was uh, by the Constitutional Court. Um, and that allowed uh, about 10 very small parties, um, most with, I think, just one MP, to also gain a party list seat. Um, and these parties aligned themselves with uh, Palang Pracharat Party. Uh, and that's what allowed Prayut to be selected as, as prime minister, in spite of the fact that he's not a member of a political party and he's not an MP. So with the military having this mechanism to manipulate elections, do you think this will bring an end to the constant cycle of coups? Uh, not necessarily. Um, a lot of people believed um, that after uh, the Black May incident in 1992, where the army came out and, and shot down pro-democracy demonstrators in the streets of Bangkok, um, that, uh, that that would be the end of, of military intervention in, in Thai politics. Um, that was the impetus for the drafting of the 1997 constitution, which, uh, was the most liberal that Thailand has had. And it was that constitution that, that paved the way for Thaksin Shinawat to, to gain office. Um, so I think a lot of people believed, um, after the 97 constitution that we wouldn't see any more coups. Uh, but of course, that was wrong. So I think it's um, it's always difficult to write it off as a as a possibility. Uh, I think one of the one of the dynamics that we see now is that um, there's a lot of popular resistance to to the 2017 Constitution. Um, it's seen as as something that was born out of the 2014 coup uh, that was drafted in the interests of the status quo. Um, that was ratified in a referendum that was unfair. Uh, and there's broad support, I think, for, for the, the Constitution to at least be amended, if not scrapped and, and completely rewritten. So let's turn away from Bangkok for a bit and head to the southern fringe of Thailand in the Muslim-majority areas near the Malaysian border. There has been a breakaway conflict bubbling away down there for years now. And I was wondering if you could summarize it a bit for us. Sure. I mean, there's there's been um, an insurgency in in the south in one form or another since the the mid 1970s. 
Um, it, it was largely dormant in the 1990s, but came roaring back um, really beginning at the end of 2001, and particularly uh, in January 2004, when there was an arms raid on a uh, military base in Ratiwat province, where something like 400 small arms were, were stolen by insurgents. Uh, and thereafter, the level of violence was, was sustained at a high level for, for several years. Um, initially, uh, it was difficult to say with certainty who was behind it, but it, it's, um, it became clear after a few years that it was actually one of the long-established uh, Malay Muslim Liberation Fronts, the Barisan Revolution Nationale, the National Revolutionary Front, um, which was founded in 1960. Um, and which in the in the 90s really went back to the drawing board in terms of coming up with a strategy. Uh, so they spent years um, recruiting, uh, indoctrinating uh, people and were able to sustain uh, a, a fairly high level of violence uh, in, the, in the context of this long running insurgency uh, since 2004. Um, there have been on and off again efforts to to have uh, a dialogue between the Thai government and Malay Muslim militants. Uh, it seemed to be taking a, a step forward um, early this year uh, when BRN um, met with Thai officials and agreed to have uh, 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 an official dialogue process to, to seek a resolution. Not much has come of that so far, and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is at least partly responsible. So there's been a project that's been talked about for years in Thailand known as the Thai Canal Project, digging a huge canal through the thinnest part of South Thailand. This way you could circumnavigate the choke point around the Strait of Malacca and Malaysian waters. How likely do you think it would be that this project will go ahead? Yeah, I mean, this idea has been around for hundreds of years. Um, it comes up uh, periodically. Uh, it seems like maybe with, with greater frequency now than... Uh, than a decade ago, but um, my my own sense is that it's unlikely to happen. Um, that uh, yeah, the costs involved are too great. Um, the you know potential savings uh, are are not enough to to justify it. Um, but of course, it it seems it seems clear that uh, one beneficiary of of such a canal would be uh, the People's Republic of China. And with that, is China gaining influence in Thailand like it is in Malaysia or Myanmar? Or is Bangkok still firmly orientated towards friends in Washington? Well, there's a cliche about, about you know, Thai foreign policy, which is that it's like uh, bamboo in the wind, right? It's, it's, it's firmly rooted, but it, it sort of shifts with the, the, the prevailing winds. And, um, and that's what allows the, the country to maintain its sovereignty and, and to prosper. Um, I think, you know, there's probably truth in that, um, that as well. Um, I think, I think Thai um, policymakers will be keen uh, to, to maintain for, uh, for the kingdom uh, as much leeway as possible. Um, so we may see some balancing of, of Chinese uh, um, interests uh, against those of the United States. Um, I think Thailand will will wish to keep it, its its options open. We've already talked about it in previous episodes, just how important Southeast Asia will be to the balance of power. And Thailand sits at the very heart of that region. Thailand is a powerhouse when compared to most of its neighbors, and often helps shape the overall trajectory of the region. But where is Thailand heading? Who will it look to partner up with to push through these tough times? Will they return to Washington or seek out Hanoi? Will they take a look at Kuala Lumpur or increase ties with Beijing? Well, for that, we turn to our next guest. Part 2. Goldilocks Syndrome uh, Well, Thailand's always... well. First of all, Thailand is the, was the only country that wasn't a colonial possession in Southeast Asia among the 10 ASEAN countries plus some more less day. Um, so it accomplished that in some part historically by 
relatively effective diplomacy, but also to some extent by preying on its neighbors or sacrificing them, um, which I guess you could also call somewhat effective diplomacy. Joshua Kalanzi is an expert on Southeast Asia, specializing in Thailand for the Council on Foreign Relations. He has appeared on radio stations all around the world for his expertise, and he joins us today. So today, you know, Thailand is still sort of plays that intermediary role. Um, it straddles sort of, it is a U.S. treaty ally and has close relations also with Japan and, and Australia, um, but is probably the, of the big Southeast Asian countries, the one that has the closest links to um, China as well. So Thailand has a much larger economy than most people would expect having the 19th largest GDP in 2019. Why is it so much richer than some of its direct neighbors like Cambodia, Laos, or even its oil-rich neighbor to the south, Malaysia, at 100, 105th, and 28th ranking by GDP, respectively? Thailand was relatively well-run economically um, in the period of like really high growth for a lot of other other Southeast Asian countries too, like Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore. Philippines. Um, They were an authoritarian state, um, but the various authoritarian leaders allowed a certain amount of sort of technocracy. They benefited from massive um, Japanese investment, as did a number of other Southeast Asian states. Thailand also, you know, has huge downsides. It has one of the worst income inequalities in the world. Um, At some points in the last couple of years, it's been the worst has a massively stratified society and um, the economy has, you know, it grew really, really enormously in the cold war. And then since the late nineties has grown somewhat more slowly and a fair amount of the economy now today is dependent on tourism too, which is always somewhat risky because tourism can be affected by a lot of things. But right now it's like really problematic. For a nation so reliant on tourism for funding and hard currency, how is COVID going to be affecting their economy? In Thailand, they're still massively yeah, dependent on on tourism and their biggest sources of tourism is China and other wealthy Asian countries and secondarily Europe and the and the US. And most of those countries, you know, even though some of those countries, not the US, but some of those other countries have done a pretty good job, people aren't going to be excited about going on a plane to Thailand. So I mean, I, I don't know offhand what the latest projections is, but I mean, they got like 40 million in tourists last year, something like that, 39 million, 40 million, and like a quarter of them were from China. So I think, you know, they're, they're in huge distress because first of all, a lot of Chinese people are just not going to be able to travel to Thailand because the economy is hit hard in China. Second, there's some pressure by the Chinese government to spend money at home. And then third, it's just going to be really hard for any tourist site to lure anyone right now. So having spent a bit of time in Thailand myself and talking with some locals in the country, particularly in the east, these all seem to have a fear of one country invading them, and that country is Cambodia. Uh, Phnom Penh's armed forces are much smaller and they're far less equipped. So what I want to understand is why is there so many people in the east of Thailand fear an invasion from Cambodia of all places? I mean, there's a lot of antipathy based on some historical anger going back decades and centuries. And more recently, when the when the Khmer Rouge were driven out, I mean, it's not that recent, but we're talking about compared to temples and structures that were built hundreds of centuries ago. But um, when the Khmer Rouge were driven out by the invading Vietnamese forces, they fled to the Thai-Cambodian border and sort of built this alliance and quotes with a bunch of other groups supported not directly but essentially supported by the U.S. and other actors and not the greatest certainly not the highlight of U.S. foreign policy Um, and they stayed along the border there and continued to attack and harass Cambodian government but yeah the relationship between Thailand and its less wealthy neighbors particularly in Cambodia and Thailand Laos and Thailand and Myanmar and Thailand Vietnam and Thailand less so Vietnam is a little bit more just geographically removed and a little wealthier. The relationship is really complex because Thailand has been historically 
sort of a source of both instability and stability for those countries. Thailand has fom often fomented instability in those countries, even taken part of their territory. While the same, this is in modern times, not talking about hundreds of years ago. Um, while at the same time in modern times, Thailand has often been a, so a source of some degree of stability where people went, some political dissidents fled from those countries. That's not so true anymore, but um, Thailand was a source of revenue for those countries too, because a lot of migrants went. So, but um, I don't think Cambodia is unique. Thailand has that same problematic relationship with Myanmar and Laos too. If we take a look at Thailand's northwest border with Myanmar or Burma, we can see a large source of tension. Uh, we will go through this a lot more with our third guest, but a huge amount of the Thai drug trade comes through the fairly porous borders in the north with Myanmar. How does this cross-border drug trade impact relations between Bangkok and Nipido, the capital of Myanmar? Back in the day, back in the Cold War, there was large areas in northern Thailand that were not under sort of complete government control. Now the problem, I mean, the problem is that there's areas of northeastern Myanmar um, under control of both insurgent armies like the United Wasit Army and others, and also government-linked armies are essentially proxies for the for the military, all both of which are huge, historically were huge narcotic um, heroin producers and are now massive producers of methamphetamine and other things like fentanyl. And there's transshipment through Thailand, but I, it's it's not this exactly in the same way it was back in the Cold War, where there was was complete lawlessness. The lawlessness is more on one side, on the other side, on the Thai side, I would say is more like a problem with graft, and which I guess you could call lawlessness and complicity among some authorities. Uh, yeah, I mean the relationship along the Thai Myanmar border is problematic in terms of drugs. It's been it was problematic for decades in terms of cross border fighting because for years Thailand had sheltered a um, number of refugees, some of whom went back in Myanmar and attacked them. It's problematic in terms of public health. It's problematic in terms of um, Manchester's mind. And so um, it's historically been really problematic. And then you add in that that area of Northeast Myanmar is also, um, some of those groups are extreme, have close relations with China. You have very, but at the same time, China has aggressively tried to crack down on the drug trade. Um, this is, is a, yeah, it's become a very complicated situation. It hasn't really improved since the election of Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD government, National League for Democracy government in 2015. Um, the fighting in Myanmar hasn't gotten better. The drug trade hasn't really improved. Um, relations with Thailand and Myanmar are probably a little better than since before Suu Kyi, but overall, it's the other issues haven't really been resolved at all. Moving south now to the thin border between Thailand and Malaysia. Historically, this area has been rife with Muslim separatists wanting to pull away from Bangkok's rule. And this has always been a point of contention between Bangkok and Kuala Lumpur. Uh, with a rough ceasefire in place at the moment, though, what are relations like between Thailand and Malaysia? They don't have this same problematic relationship in the same problems as Thailand has with these other neighbors in which historically... Thailand was both the source of stability and instability. Um, the insurgency in southern Thailand, which has been, it, I mean, they had a ceasefire now because of coronavirus, but, you know, has gone on for 20 years or so in this, now in, in this current iteration of previous iterations in the 60s, 70s, has always been a problem or a thorn. And and there was a level of distrust of the from the Thai government and the Royal Thai Army at particularly in the past, less so now, but still to some extent that some of the insurgents were sheltering in Malaysia or people linked to the insurgents, which, which is certainly true that were people have been, but um, it's not the same level of distrust with some of those mainland Southeast Asian neighbors. I mean, they have a pretty good working relationship. And um, I mean, the situation in Southern Thailand, although there's ceasefire now, is still really problematic. It's sort of like another generation of insurgents has emerged, but the level of cooperation between Thai government and Malaysian government is is, is pretty good. It's and in, the relationship isn't as punctured on and uh, by so much historical distrust as those other relationships, I would say. But there certainly are some historical issues. The other big one I want to talk about is China. 
China is buying up large stakes into Thailand at the moment and has invested in quite a lot of schools, mega projects, and real estate all throughout the country. And although there seems to be a fair chunk of anti-Beijing sentiment, the Thai government seems to be warming more and more towards Beijing. Uh, what are the real relations like between Thailand and China? I, don't, I mean, everyone is by, buys influence to some extent. I mean, I don't think China is doing anything, certainly not necessarily unique. Um, I think just to step back, I mean, there's this long historical ties between Thailand and China. Thailand, even during the Cold War, even at the worst periods of Cold War, when China was pretty isolated from most of the rest, most of the um, non-communist world, Thailand still ma maintained um, kind of behind the scene links to China and a huge number of proportion of, the, of the Thai population just migrated from southern China and Thailand has had, with some certainly problematic problems, particularly in the 40s and the 50s, has had one of the best records in Southeast Asia of countries of um, assimilating Chinese migrants without the types of convulsions of racial violence that occurred in Indonesia, Malaysia, um, and other places. There's So there's deep historical links and cultural links, and China provides important, really important um, investment in diplomatic assistance. So it's not like they're buying um, Thailand any more than, say, anyone else, I think it um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think at this point, Thailand is pursuing both relationships. I don't think they're steadfast really in anything. Um, his, I think the military still relies on the relationship with the U.S., but that's been embittered somewhat because of the U.S. becoming more and more, less, a little bit less so under Trump, but still fed up with Thailand's cycle of democratic breakdown and, and military rule. Some in the military, you know, appreciate that China doesn't really seem to care that much about that. But at the same time, they still prefer sort of some aspects of the U.S. relationship. I mean, economically, China is by far the dominant actor already in Southeast Asia everywhere. So, but Thailand is really like most Southeast Asian countries trying not to have to choose. I mean, frankly, like almost everywhere, including Australia. Um, I mean, Australia is in a similar position, actually, as in many ways as Thailand, although Australia obviously has assets, huge assets that Thailand doesn't bring to bear. But, it, you know, Australia's economy is hugely dependent on China. China has massive economic leverage over Australia. The Australian exports to China are different than the relationship with Thailand, where China's economic leverage is a little bit different, but it's massively, has massive economic leverage. Yet at the same time, Thailand and Australia both remain military allies of the main regional competitor of China, um, Australia, closer military ally, but still both military allies. So they're getting their security relationship from a country that's now increasingly in a very terrible relationship with a country that's their most important economic partner. That's a problematic situation, you know, for anyone. It requires absolutely skillful diplomacy, even if you're a really wealthy country like Australia. So I think, yeah, Thailand has struggles with that, like any country would. Cambodia has a much closer relationship with China, even allegedly looking at allowing China to build a large naval facility in the Gulf of Thailand in Cambodian waters. Do you think Thailand would ever go down that road, tying itself closer with Beijing, or just continue trying to keep a foot in both camps like it is currently? They want to do what they're doing now as for as long as they can, which is, I think, again, similar. And that might not be really great long-term strategy, but I mean, I think bicycling in, in places while, you know, huge powers rattle sabers is a terrible strategy. So they want to continue to, as best they can pursuing closer economic relations and some degree of closer diplomatic relations with China while maintaining the U.S. security network to some extent, just like everyone else in the region to a lesser or greater extent except Japan, just like Australia, just like, I mean, there's different shades, like of it but most of the countries in the region have now trying to finesse this balance so no i don't think that thailand will want to do that cambodia is in a much different situation than thailand cambodia is ostracized by most of the world ostracized by the us and the eu a little bit less ostracized by australia but um hugely dependent on chinese aid and so i wouldn't be surprised if china was able to negotiate such basing rights but 
Cambodia has very little to push back in with. Another aspect of Thailand we tend to associate with it is drugs and drug trafficking. And a lot of other nations also partake in this, but for some reason Thailand seems to have picked up a certain reputation for it. Which is odd. Why would a tough, military-ruled country have such a reputation with being drug traffickers? It's a complicated question. So for that, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. The Highs and lows. During the riots in sort of 2016, 2017, you know, I found myself um, catching up with the Thai officials. So we're walking through the protest lines where a week later they're shooting bullets down the road at each other. Um, you know, sitting in a coffee shop watching tourists move through um, the same protest lines. And nowhere around the world, I think, would you see that sort of thing or... Um, you know, you sit in Hajai in southern Thailand, you know, the, the heart of the southern insurgency, and you see bongo vans turn up filled full of European tourists who, you know, backpackers who are going from um, Penang Island in Malaysia up to um, the southern Thailand beach resorts. And it's a really strange thing. For whatever reason, people feel wonderfully safe there. So, um, And there's always this sort of simmering you know, a variety of issues. And we can, we'll talk about it, you know, like we can talk, we'll talk about in terms of terrorism. So, you know, 2015, the Erwin bomb shrine. And, you know, everyone's sitting there in the Western world going, oh my God, who could have done this? Um, and in reality, the list is as bad as long as my arm. Was it Southern insurgents? Was it Uyghurs? Was it Hamas or Hezbollah who've got headquarters there? Um, was it um, the remnants of JI? Was it the, the rising IS? Was it... Um, uh, was it, uh, you know, was it the red shirts or the yellow shirts? And the list goes on. So it was the, you know, it's it's one of those really strange places. John Coyne is the head of the Strategic Policing and Law Enforcement Division for the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in Canberra. He specialises in border security, the international drug trade, and organised crime. And he joins us today. Thailand finds itself right now. Um, it finds itself at the centre of, of a series of, of seismic changes. So it finds itself on the front line of a global war on drugs. It finds itself central to a Chinese soft power exercise in terms of the, of the expansion of the One Belt, One Road. Uh, it finds itself as a, as a leader within the ASEAN, econo uh, ASEAN group in terms of economic and security integration. Um, and it finds itself wedged between... An insurgency in its south, a criminal insurgency or a terrorist insurgency, depending on who you believe, and a criminal insurgency in the north um, in terms of the production of methamphetamine. Um, and to the east, it finds itself, unfortunately, um, once again, dealing with the issues of its neighbours, so with Cambodia, so both in terms of, um, you know, arguments over borders, but also more specifically... Um, the illicit trade. So, you know, in 2015, 16, 250 people killed both poachers and um, government, Thai government officials over Siamese redwood in the borders of uh, Cambodia and Thailand. So you just alluded to the Thai war on drugs. So what I want to know is what drugs are we talking about here and who are they selling these drugs to? So Thailand, and, and most people don't realise, when we talk about the war on drugs, Thailand is, was, was really particularly successful. So it became poppy free over a period of about a decade. So no opium poppy is produced in, in Thailand these days. Um, but having said that, it finds itself, unfortunately, right next door to the perfect storm of, of, of criminal activity. So what we've seen over the last decade is a growth in the production of methamphetamine. So in Australia or in the US, you know, meth, ice, you know, the, the high grade stuff, um, but it started off with the production of what they call yaba, which is a um, is a low socioeconomic drug. It's a low purity um, pill form generally of, of um, synthetic drugs. So it's a, it is a methamphetamine, but usually cut heavily with um, usually cut heavily uh, with caffeine. So what we've seen in this perfect storm is a series of things occur. So first off, we saw the rise of a huge, um, you know, 46,000 plus sites of uh, chemical and pharmaceutical production on mainland China. Um, very difficult for the Chinese authorities to regulate. Then what we saw is a crackdown in terms of law enforcement on those sites. So we saw a dislocation um, of the production of 
of synthetic drug precursors. Interesting enough, in the 1970s, um, and this is this perfect storm, in the 1970s, the Taiwanese government began investing heavily in STEM. So, um, and those people who were educated in STEM found themselves being part of the Chinese economic miracle. Now, as the Chinese education system picked up into the 90s and into the thousands, um, they returned, they had their own people, mainlanders, to work in those STEM jobs. So those people returned to Taiwan. Um, Next, what we saw is, you know, the series of um, stalemates in terms of ethnic insurgencies in places like the Shan and Wa states. So um, what we saw there then is this perfect storm. What once those those armies and cultural, uh, sorry, those um, ethnic groups were doing was being involved in the heroin trade. Um, they moved into the meth trade, but in a different way as rent takers. So they just allowed... Chinese organised crime groups to bring Chinese precursors into that part of Myanmar. Uh, Taiwanese cooks were imported who brought it across. Um, the ASEAN economic miracle of border integration reduced the border controls. And at the same time, um, the investment by the Chinese government in the One Belt, One Road initiative created all new economic activity and connections. Um, so drugs were being produced in, in bigger and bigger quantities. So about 18 months ago, I was in the Mekong and I went to a, um, a drug lab seizure of a 20-acre clandestine lab. So in Australia, we talk about a clandestine lab, um, maybe in a small warehouse or in someone's garage. I want you to imagine a 20-acre um, clandestine lab. They had a dual production line producing high-grade methamphetamine for for. Uh, US and uh, Australian markets, and at the same time, in parallel, a low-grade Yaba manufacturing. Um, what these guys have been able to do is drop the price, the wholesale price of methamphetamine. So in the streets of Vietnam over a 12-month period, a kilo of methamphetamine at the wholesale price dropped by about 25%. At the retail, um, the market across the region is being flooded with low-grade, uh, sorry, low-priced um methamphetamine, both Yaba and um, what we would call, again, ice in Australia. So this is sort of a perfect storm of activity. Interestingly enough, you know, um, it's incredibly, you know, you lay a corruption over the top of that uh, and you, you've got a real recipe that's very difficult to unpick. And certainly the Thai government in um, its role last year as a secretary of ASEAN um, has been trying to raise this issue of integrating security and economic um, growth and integration. And which nations are buying this high quality meth? They're flooding into a, to a number of different markets. So there's definitely a very strong link um, of that methamphetamine into um, Canada, into Australia. Um, there was a report released in the last 24 hours which seems to indicate that, you know, almost 90% of methamphetamine in Hong Kong comes from the Mekong sub region. So it comes from Myanmar. Um, and it's flooding into the region. So where the Mexican cartels in um, in terms of their methamphetamine introduced themselves and became truly global entrepreneurs, so what they did is they, they, they really engaged with the concept of just-in-time supply. Um, these groups are surviving through COVID-19 because they've got, and this is from you know authorities in Myanmar and Laos, they believe they've got up to 12 months of precursors for the production of methamphetamine stockpiled in those countries. So um, they're COVID-proof. Australia in particular has an incredibly strict border control. I, mean, I can barely get an apple into the country, let alone a pound of meth. So how are these drug cartels getting their product from Thailand into places like Australia and Canada? So what I want to imagine is, is okay, imagine that you and I, you're, I'm Thailand and you're... Uh, and if I only send you 100 packages a day and I've got to put one package of drugs in there, there's one in 100 chance that that'll get detected. But if I've got 1,000 or 10,000 or the level of, of, of normal traffic between us increases, the easier it is to hide things. So one part of this problem in an equation is, is greater global um, economic integration, which produces high levels of traffic of trade. So you've got more, and in essence, you've got more to hide things in. Um, however, the other part of it is, is these guys, you know, these guys are smart. They're entrepreneurs. They're innovating all the time and finding new ways. Um, my gravest fear is that we could see in time, you know, there was all in law enforcement. Um, when da the dark web verse became um, became and emerged and people started to get 
an awareness of it. There was a thought that, you know, it could be this grave problem. And, and fortunately, we're really lucky because it never really mainstreamed in that sense. So, you know, the average person in, in Sydney or Melbourne just didn't engage with, you know, I'm going to log on on a Monday to order my drugs um, from overseas and, uh, you know, they'll come on a Thursday and I'll use them on a Friday night. Um, however, uh, I think as time has gone by, that that level of micro imports is changing, and I think this is one of the big risks. So, you know, um, without going into philosophical arguments about the drug trade, the essence of the story is this, which is that law enforcement, their role is to reduce the supply of drugs in our community. So um, they have to prioritise their efforts. So they look for the big seizures. Um, so they seize, you know, one tonne of drugs. Uh, and, you know, this is where you see this continual experience. And now the evidence is that that's not re reducing supply in our communities. Um, so I, I have a real suspicion that, you know, there's and one way that organised crime will really disrupt law enforcement is by really moving and making a big move to micro imports. Um, so if you, and, you know, I'm not creating a how-to guide, but, you know, the chances that, so for instance, if you do order your drugs online and they arrive, um, to your PO box, the police, if they do disrupt them, they might, they'll take them off you. And there's some places in the world now that guarantee if they don't get you your drugs, you'll get the next load for free. In this case scenario, the police might turn up and say, stop ordering drugs online, you've been warned, here's a criminal warning, because the whole of the criminal justice system is really focused on on disrupting big supply. Um, what's happening in the in the Mekong sub-region is changing that. Um, so the cost of production, so people go, oh, you know, a million, a million or a ton of drugs has been detected, and and the police have seized it, and then the police go and cost that at what the at the per hit street value, but that's not what drug, um, that's not what organised crime groups are losing. Uh, they've been able to reach a certain scale of production where you know, it, it's really just marginally more to produce more drugs. So, you know, the cost of imports are such now, and the access to precursors they just up the level of profit now. So we know the drugs get distributed from Thailand, but let's go further at the supply chain where it all comes from before that and talk about Myanmar. How is Myanmar involved in the drug trade here? Well, look, I think when I say it's a, it's a perfect storm because Myanmar, and, and quite often people say, oh, you know, is it, they'll say, is the Myanmar government involved in this? You know, and ask those sorts of questions. No, no is the answer to that. Uh, are there some corrupt officials in Myanmar probably in some way connected to this? Yes, they are. But the real issue is, is that there's a series of, of, of zones where um, criminal organisations can act with impunity. Um, they can buy that impunity in, in some of those zones, so the Wa State and the Shan State. So they, they can buy that from by paying rent in better terms to um, the ethnic militias, but they can act there and they're, they're close enough they're close enough to the supply chains of precursors in China um, and there's long, porous borders and they can act with impunity. And now, you know, as I was saying earlier, with the great investments in, um, in infrastructure and the One Belt, One Road initiatives and the reduction in border controls by ASEAN economic integration, um, you can rapidly move... Um, you can rapidly move from the north of Thailand by road to um, Bangkok. And, you know, and the, the traffic that is moving along there is significant and increasing. So the drugs get made in Myanmar, but Myanmar doesn't make the chemical precursors. So where do they come from? So what, where these precursors are coming from is mainland China. Um, and, you know, there's literally tens of thousands. It's the Chinese um, economic dream. Tens of thousands of chemical and pharmaceutical um, sites have been established across mainland China. Um, the Chinese government's struggle is is how do you regulate um, that industry? Now, there's a big difference between um, between spying on your people as an authoritarian country and regulating industry. And I don't think they have a strong tradition in regulation. And and what backs that hypothesis is the significant quantity. So China, and, you know, mark my words of this, Chinese precursors are going to Myanmar, but they're also being sent to Mexico uh, where they're being used for the production of methamphetamines there. So they're a global source of precursors uh, for the production of synthetic drugs, and, the, and they're a global supplier of synthetic opioids. Um, so... That is the source, and the movement really is almost unregulated. You know, when it comes from China to uh, from China to Myanmar, and the other problem with this is that uh, 
you know, many of the many of the drugs, and there's two components here: precursors and finished synthetics. And we'll talk about precursors first. Many of the precursors aren't actually illegal, so you know, you, you, they're just being exported. You know, and I mean, the argument is, you know, some of them are used in cleaning products or you know other other method, things that are manufactured. Um, but you know, there there is no so, so there's no legitimate um, there's no legitimate reason to export. Uh, pseudoephedrine, for example, the, one of the precursors for methamphetamine or saffron oil from um, mainland China to Myanmar. But there is a, a huge quantity that's constantly being moved across there. So does the Chinese government know these chemicals are being used to manufacture meth and are just turning a blind eye to the whole situation? Or have these companies actually fooled the Chinese authorities and are getting away with it? They have, as a government prioritise the Chinese government to prioritise two things. So being an authoritarian government over their own people and secondly on economic growth. So um, that rapid economic growth is what makes this possible. You know, there's no difference between... So, you know, um, several years ago I, I was on the Myanmar border and uh, it, it's illegal to export um, rough-cut timber from Myanmar to, um, to China. However, down on that border the Chinese um, have... have have brought all of their silica plants down onto the border of Myanmar and producing silica. Um, the only way to produce silica is through charcoal, which is used rough cut timber. So when you go to the border, um, you know, you speak to border officials and um, and on either side, you go, is it illegal to export rough cut timber from Myanmar? And I go, yes, of course it is. And I'm like, what about this truck with rough cut timber on it? Um, and to their response to that is it's being exported by sea. See, it's on the paperwork. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that, you know, there's it, regulation and corruption in, in this region is incredibly challenging. So if the meth is being made in Myanmar, why not send it from Myanmar? Why get it across another border into Thailand before it goes off to places like New Zealand, Canada, or Australia in the US? Uh, you know what? You have to inject it into the into the legal distribution system. So, you know, um, the amount of, of economic... Um, movement so of goods from Myanmar is significantly less than say Thailand or Vietnam, and the connectivity directly between Vietnam uh, between Myanmar and say Canada or Myanmar and Australia is limited. So by bringing it down, you're reducing your risk. So the other domestic drug market we haven't talked about yet is China. Uh, the reports I'm reading are suggesting that the meth consumption in China is growing incredibly rapidly at the moment. Uh, is there any truth to those rumours? Over the last decade or so, I think the Chinese government has has just really, up until probably the last five years, has really um, has denied it has a domestic drug problem. It's just relied on you know the Maoist approach that you know no one will do drugs; drugs are illegal. More recently, and this is where we've seen over the last five, so last five years, so it started with there was a village in mainland China where just about everybody was employed producing, and they call it the meth village. It was almost everyone was employed or you in the production of um, methamphetamine. So I think the Chinese government have really come to the conclusion that they have a domestic problem. Um, and with a growing middle class, that's not surprising. And and probably very much the same case for, for countries like Vietnam, where, you know, the economic success has seen a, a rapidly growing middle class, um, higher disposable incomes, um, you know, a younger population that... Um, that is looking for alternatives in terms of recreational drugs, you know, moving from alcohol, etc. Um, so, I think the domestic it's domestic use there by growing middle class. But when you're talking about you know tablets of yaba for under one dollar US, they become incredibly, uh, you know, it, it it's a very attractive for use by a range of people. So one of the reasons we know so much about the domestic consumer drug markets is via wastewater testing, which governments ranging from the US to Canada and Australia all take part in. Uh, can you explain a bit about wastewater testing and how it works? Um, look, about three years ago, four years ago, the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission with, uh, uh, with um, support from the government began what they call a wastewater survey um, a project. And what it did is it, across a number of different sites in Australia every quarter, it would go to the sewerage system and test the sewerage system for drugs, uh, and range of drugs, tobacco, alcohol, etc. And from that, it can make an assessment on on the rate of consumption, purity, a range of factors. Um, and interesting enough, and I remember sitting down with the then um, 
when they were first discussing this, I was sitting down with the then Commissioner of the Australian Border Force, Roman Quadvillig, and he told me, he goes, you know, John, this wastewater survey is going to dramatically change law enforcement in this country. And I said, oh, you think so? And he goes, yeah, because we'll know, you know, what it, how poorly we're really doing and impacting on supply. And it's really interesting because when you follow the wastewater survey, the evidence is really quite clear um, that despite record seizures, despite a 2015 um, uh, inquiry into ice use in this country, despite a, a national ice task force um, and a national ice strategy and everything else, consumption of um, consumption of methamphetamines in this country remains um, pretty much unchanged by the wastewater survey data. And, of course, there's always these people who argue and they go, oh, the problem could always be worse, but that doesn't really float with me. I think that, um, you know, we need a drastic change in strategy. But um, the wastewater survey is is a critical piece of information that comes into the decision-making in this country or should do, um, and it shows just that we have a problem in terms of consumption of a range of drugs. So if we know there's a problem, is that actually a way of fighting this war on drugs or are we just throwing good money after bad at this one? So number one, if, if the question is, um, the criminalisation of addiction uh, is it has just terrible results, okay? Um, even the criminalisation of, of, of drug use. So I, I think we need to sharpen our harm minimisation folks. And by that, so if, if I take a 16-year-old kid who has a $20 foil of marijuana and a police officer picks him up or her up, and decides to charge him or her with possession. She won't probably get it. They won't probably get any um, time. But um, they'll inject him into the justice system, which over time will have only negative results for them. Um, you know, same as like for instance, think of it this way: a 22-year-old young woman is lining up to go to a festival in Sydney um, in front of her two police officers. So she has a choice. She says, "I down the three tablets that I have in my bra and and possibly die of an overdose." Um, or alternatively, I get injected for, into the justice system for possession and lose my job, and you know, and it's a spiral from there. So number one is I think that we have to we have to change our way of that. Number two is um, with harm minimisation. This debate around pill testing is a good one. Um, I think that what we really need, if the choice is um, saving some children or some young people with pill testing, we should do it. The evidence from injection rooms, safe injection rooms in Sydney, are really clear. So um, you know. 6,000 plus overdoses over the last decade and, you know, no deaths, um, which is fantastic. However, I don't think that, um, I don't think that the decriminalisation or legalisation of, of illicit, currently illicit drugs is a solution either. So um, for those who turn around, I look at illicit tobacco. So most of the very senior um, UK organised crime figures have moved to the production of and involvement in the distribution of illicit tobacco because, um they can they just undercut the legitimate prices. Um, they make a huge profit, and at worst, they get a slap on the wrist. And what we're seeing in North America and Canada is the same. So, um, the model for marijuana is either sell better marijuana or um, sell marijuana at a cut price below the legal price. So, it doesn't impact on organised crime. But uh, there are times it works, and Thailand's a good example of that. So, um, Thailand once was a was a hotbed of, for the growth of opium poppy. Um, the Thai government, along with international assistance, they didn't just go through and slash and burn and, and poison crops. What they did is they gave an alternative and they created markets. So what they did is they built roads into the regions. Um, they assisted them with alternative crops, flowers, tea, but at the same time joined them with international markets and that's a success. Right now in, um, right now in Myanmar, there's a 1,000 families who are um, growing coffee under a UN project instead of opium poppy. Um, but... They just didn't tell them to grow coffee. What they did is they got some Colombians to come out and identify the best coffee that could be grown there. Um, then they found a market. So this stuff is actually being grown and the beans are being sent um, as high-end coffee beans to um, France and being sold all over France. So those 1,000 families aren't involved in the growth of opium poppy. So I do think interventions work. Roughshod ones don't. Um, and certainly... Um, you know, from a personal perspective, it's very difficult to see how um, how methamphetamine could be safely used. Thailand is a land full of contradictions. It was one of the first to give people the right to vote, but seems to have a military coup every time there's too much democracy. <laughs> 
They brag about their democratic values, but jail people for years for speaking ill of the king. And most of the election results are already baked into the cake, well before any voter ever puts a pen to paper. In 2018, Bangkok was the most visited tourist city in the world, with almost 25 million tourists flocking to the city. Majority of them having no idea what systems are in place to hold the Thai democratic process in check. And it's honestly mind-boggling. Then there's the drugs. When supply chains and businesses all went international, it was no surprise the drugs did too. With Chinese chemicals being cooked in Burmese jungles and mail from Thai ports, drug trafficking has grown far beyond sneaking suitcases through an airport or trying to manufacture small amounts of drugs in a rundown house. The sheer volume of international trade these days means that an understaffed border force can only check a small percentage of the deluge of containers and packages that comes in every single day. And even if they catch some, they can never catch them all. The next few years will be crucial for the Thai Kingdom. With a drying up of tourist dollars, a straining of the economy, an unpopular king, and a looming constitutional crisis, Thailand will be looking for a rock in this storm. Who that rock is, though, is not yet known. Thank you so much for listening to this week's program. It was really interesting doing the research for this one. Tourists and tanks is an interesting combination. If you want to hear more from the show, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter on at the Red Line Pod, where we share new episodes, maps, articles, and predictions for theaters all around the world. You can also find my personal Twitter at Mike Kelly at Oz. Oz is in Australia. The biggest thanks, though, goes out to our Patreons, who help keep this show afloat through their amazing donations. Every dollar donated goes straight back into the show, so we can hire more editors, writers, and researchers to bring you bigger and better shows. And the goal at the moment is to bring in a video team to turn these podcasts into full videos with maps, graphs, and footage, something I know will take the show to the next level. I regularly chat with the Patreons myself and thank each and every one of you for your support of the show. You guys are the reason we are doing so well. So thank you again. Another thanks goes out to our amazing guests this week. Matt Wheeler does some amazing work with the Crisis Center and gave a great insight into what it's like at the moment on the ground there in Thailand. Matt was an absolute pleasure to have on the show, and we hope to have him back soon. And you can find Matt on Twitter at Matt Z Wheeler. Josh Glanzik is from the amazing team over at the Council on Foreign Relations, and has a great insight into not only the region's past, but also its future. Seeing the moves that may have big impacts on what is fast becoming the new Cold War battleground. If you want to read more of Josh's work, he can be found on Twitter at Josh Kulanzik. John Coyne was amazing to have on and brought an aspect we don't often get to talk about at the show. John has spent years advising the Australian government on organized crime and drugs, and his work often shapes policy. So hearing from some of his opinions on the current drug war was pretty eye-opening. I'm very sure we'll be inviting John back on the show quite soon. He can be found on Twitter at John Coyne 14. As you may have noticed, the sound quality in this episode was absolutely amazing, and that's thanks to our newest staff member, Joe, who helps out with some of the editing for these episodes. It's amazing to have Joe as part of the team, helping us out and keeping the quality of this show as good as it can be. If you want to follow more of Joe's work or even chat with Joe yourself, you can find Joe on Twitter at JoeHawthorne77. It also goes without saying, but another big thanks goes out to Mark Spencer for providing the vocals in this episode that weren't mine. Mark is one of the busiest guys in the business, running some of the most cutting edge and fantastic shows around. So the help he gives us here at The Red Line is incredibly appreciated. I highly recommend you check out his Twitter where he shares nothing but some of his amazing work as well as The Great Climactic Show. And you can find Mark on Twitter at Climactic Show. And the last thanks though goes out to you. We had another bumper month last month. I saw more DMs, emails and chats than ever before come through to me. And it meant so much to see so many people reach out to the show with questions, comments, or even to just chat over Zoom with a drink. Every single one of these put a smile on my face. So I just want to say thank you again. Your support of the show is so, so, so appreciated. We'll be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night.